Uh, our presenter today is Dr. Alexander Ki Al Alexander Kitroy. Alexander Kitroy is a professor of history at Hayford College. He has been teaching since 1996. He was born in Athens and left Greece at age 14 to join relatives in England, where he finished his schooling and then went on to acquire a bachelor's degree in politics from Warwick University. He also received a master's degree from Keele University and a doctorate in modern history from the University of Oxford. After doing his national service in Greece in 1986, he began teaching at, Byzant at the Byzantine and Modern Greek Center at Queen's College at the City University of New York. In 1990, he moved across town to the Nazi Center for Hellenic Studies at New York University. His next position was at the History Department of Hay at Hayford College on Philadelphia's main line. Kitrev's research focuses on ethnicity in modern Greece and the diaspora from politics to sports. He has published five books, The Greeks in Egypt, 1919-1937, Ethnicity and Class, Griegos in America, Madrid, 92, Wrestling with the Ancient Border Greek Identity at the Olympics, Elas Europa Nasnaikos, a Catochronia Elliki Historia, The Greeks in the Making of Modern Egypt, Greek Orthodox in America and Modern History. He is continuing his collaboration with film director Maria Iliou, as a historical consultant for five documentaries, the most recent being Athens from the East to West, 1821-1896, who premiered at the Benaki Museum in Athens in early 2020. He is the first, it is the first of a five-part series on the history of modern Athens. Kitura's current projects include a book commemorating the 100-year history of the America Hellenic Educational Progressive Association from 1922 to 2022, and a book on the history of Greek-owned diner restaurants in the United States. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, Dr. Kitroev, uh, your turn. Uh, good. Thank you very much. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you and to talk about uh, the Greek Orthodox Church in America. This is a book that is an overview of the history and uh, I want to take you through that long history through a series of slides. It's almost, we could call it an, an illustrated talk. Uh, before I get into the historical trajectory that I want to share with you. Uh, my, I have to make my thanks first. Uh, uh, the Jaharis Family Foundation uh, generously funded the book. This is a, the Jaharis family started off from a village in Lesbos, Agia Paraskevi, uh, came to the United States uh, and their son Michael Jaharis became a very important philanthropist and created the family, uh, Jaharis Family Foundation with many donations, including to the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, I was honored to receive a grant that helped me uh, write this book. Uh, my other thanks go to Father Robert Stefanopoulos. Uh, Father Robert was for several years the Archbishop at the Cathedral, the Greek Orthodox Cathedral in, in Manhattan. And uh, when I was writing the book a few years ago, uh, he was retired, but, but he still went to the building adjoining the uh, cathedral where he had a huge library, his own library, and he shared his books and his knowledge. And uh, it was really, he was a wonderful help. Uh, you see him here, of course, in the picture with his wife, uh, Presbytera Niki Stefanopoulos, and their famous son in the middle, George Stephanopoulos, the television anchor. Uh, George is the famous one, but as far as I am concerned, <laughs> Father Robert is the most important Stephanopoulos for me. And finally, my third thanks to Nikki Kale, the lady you see in the red dress. She was for many years close, working closely with Archbishop Yakovos. Uh, she is uh, was serving as the, and still is, serving as the archivist of the archdiocese. 
of all the Greek American organizations, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in New York has the most extensive detailed archives. And thanks to a grant from the Nyarkos Foundation, they've put them all on PDFs. Uh, it's in the basement of the main building and Mrs. Ms. Kale is in charge. She has lived through the a big part of the history, knows those archives and was a tremendous help to me. So my thanks to those three before I launch into my uh, overview of the history of Greek Orthodoxy in America. Um, I just want to point out the, what the book is about and what the book isn't. I'm not a church historian, I'm not a theologian. So I'm looking at the relationship between the church and the Greek American community and the ways in which Greek identity was formed and the way the church adapted to the changes that the Greek American community was experiencing throughout those uh, 20 years. So it's, it's very much a history of Greek America and its church. The um, Greeks arrived in the 1890s and continued coming through the 1920s. There were 400 or so, 400,000 Greeks who arrived. One in four went back. Over 300,000 remained. Uh, and even in the, this is the World War I period, this is a newspaper from 1915, and it talks about, uh, 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 it talk, it, it give, there's a whole front page spread about Greek Orthodoxy. I wanted to share that, for, that with you. Many of you may know that uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, the town that in this that the newspaper is produced in 1909 there was an anti-Greek riot and uh, and the people and the Greeks had to get up and leave rather quickly from uh, Omaha to save their lives. They started started to trickle back and the interesting thing is that by by 1915 Omaha is respecting the Greeks because they see the significance of religion for the Greeks. And this is one of many, very many positive articles about the Greeks. There was xenophobia at the time. We know that AHEPA was formed in 1922 precisely to defend the Greeks from xenophobia. But it's also important and it's also a historical fact that many Americans respected the Greeks because of their religion uh, at that time. And this is, a, this is an example. Many, many churches were being formed throughout the United States. And in 1922, it was decided that the church becomes organized with the establishment of a central organization in New York, an archdiocese. Uh, in, in contrast with the Catholics who have uh, archdiocese in each big city, you have the archdiocese of New York, of Boston, of uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, and so on, and on the West Coast. Uh, the Greeks have one, one archdiocese in New York. It was formed by the person you see in the middle slide, Meletios Metaxakis, a tremendous leader of the church. He was Archbishop of Greece. Uh, then he became ecumenical patriarch. Then the Turks kicked him out of uh, Constantinople and he became a, a, a patriarch of in Alexandria where he uh, where he died in in the 1930s the difficulty was that the archdiocese was formed in 1922 at the height of what we know as the national schism between the supporters of Venizelos on the left and the supporters of King Constantine on the right and the problem was that that polarization was reflected in America. All the Greek communities were polarized, divided between supporters of Venizelos and the king, and that made the job of the archdiocese extremely difficult. So it had a bumpy start to, the, to its early history. Archbishop Alexandros, we see here, was the archbishop in the 1920s. Uh, he um, 
tried his best. He was he was appointed by Metaxakis, who was close to Venizelos. So he was he was identified with Venizelos, and he had a great deal of opposition. The 1920s were a, a time in which the church itself was so closely associated with Greece that it reflected Greek political differences and really the history of the church was as much building churches and defending the religion and the culture as much as it was having political fights between the Venezuelists and the uh, supporters of the king. So uh, Alexandros was persuaded to step down in 1929 so that a new uh, archbishop comes and tries to create a more unified church. And that bishop was Archbishop Athenagoras. He arrives in 1931 uh, greeted by a delegation. Interestingly, this is a clip from the New York Times the day after he arrives and uh, he, he traveled with the, with the composer Arturo Toscanini interesting little historical details and they're mentioned in the same article. Athenagoras comes along and realizes that the church is so divided, the community is so divided that he decides up till, up, up till that point the local communities were running the churches but he decides that the churches have to run themselves, that the parish has to run the community and not the community organization, the parish. At this point, let me make a little parenthesis and talk about the, the communities. What the, the Greeks, the basic form of organization that the Greeks had during the Ottoman era was a community, the Kinotita. The Kinotita was the local organization, the, the priest was obviously important, religion was important, but the Ottomans had assigned the task of tax collecting to a set of wealthy important Greeks, who we call Proesti, Dimoyerondes, Kotsabasides, you can call them different names. In English we would call them the notables. And the notables in each town were the ones who were uh, collected the taxes and basically these were social units of organization and they did other things to benefit the Greeks. So when the Greeks uh, go abroad, when they go to the diaspora, they form communities as well. And here's a little, little collage of communities that remind us the fact that the Greeks take this concept of community and establish, establish it everywhere. Trieste, um, Stuttgart, uh, uh, Paris, Cairo, Alexandria, Melbourne, Berlin are the ones I've got here. So the community is very, very, very important unit that the Greeks have. Obviously when Greece becomes a, a modern state, the state controls the communities. But, but in the diaspora, the communities are self-ruling Greek bodies. Um, in the countries the Greeks have settled. But in, in the United States we have, we have something different now because of the political divisions and because of Athenagoras' uh, arrival he decides that the church will actually supplement all the functions of the community. That means of course the church takes on all the huge responsibilities of the community organization and the, the, the biggest task of all is administering and supporting Greek language schools which is a huge effort. This is a, a little uh, slide from uh, the report that they had for the school year of 1937-38. It runs into several pages because there were many Greek language schools which the churches established throughout the United States. It was a huge task. So. The, the church has already now taken over locally the role of uh, running the schools, number one. Number two, this is 1930s with the Hinagoras. Number two, philanthropy. Philanthropy, the church takes over all the philanthropic activities of the Greek Americans through what it calls the Women's Philoptochos Society, which are um, uh, women's charity organizations which existed before the 1930s but now are there incorporated into the women's philoptochos that is attached to the parish. 
This slide on the right is just a reminder that the Philoptochos does much more than charity. Women in many ways are the backbone of the Greek church life. Uh, the Greek uh, church food festivals would never exist if it wasn't for the voluntary work of the women in the society. So that's a very important dimension. But the um, the, the the initial job that the women were assigned to do was was the charity. All Greek American charity was through the women's philoptochos. Archbishop Athenagoras uh, was a, a very charismatic and important figure and uh, was very active in the 1930s and 1940s in not only leading the Greek church but making sure that the Greek church was would start to be accepted from by the American uh, authorities and especially the White House. Uh, what helped the church was the beginning of the Cold War when the Greek, when the uh, the U.S. government believed what was suspicious of Russian Orthodoxy and wanted to encourage a Greek, the encourage the appointment of a Greek patriarch at the position of ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople. They didn't want a Russian cleric to become ecumenical patriarch because they were worried that he might be somehow blackmailed or under the influence of the Soviet government which was controlling the Russian church. So Harry Truman who met and uh, admired Athenagoras uh, works behind the scenes and Athenagoras becomes ecumenical patriarch and in fact he leaves New York and flies to Constantinople on Harry Truman's personal uh, plane and that's an example it's an example of how the Greek Orthodox Church by the late 40s had had gained not only uh, had not only become the most important institution in the Greek American community life but it was also being accepted by the U.S. government and the White House. After Athenagoras left in the 1940s, having spent 20 years building up the church in America, his successor was Archbishop Michael. Michael is the archbishop throughout the 1950s. The 1950s, as far as Greek America is concerned, is called the era of respectability. That was what Theodor Salutos described the history of Greek America. Uh, when, he, when Salutos says era of respectability, he means that by the 1950s, the children of the early immigrants or the early immigrants who had come as young children had really succeeded in America. They had succeeded with upward social mobility. They had succeeded through the GI Bill. They had succeeded through Roosevelt's New Deal. And by the 1950s, the Greek Americans are now becoming part of the American middle class. They're becoming very mainstream. Um, what also is happening in America in the 1950s, there's a great deal of religiosity. And thirdly, of course, there is this continued concern about, with the Cold War, the concern about Russian orthodoxy and the willingness to support Greek orthodoxy. And uh, Archbishop Michael, uh, who leads the church at the time is also very close to the White House and in 1957 we have the extraordinary honor for Greek Orthodoxy that Michael blesses the inauguration of Eisenhower in the uh, in the elections that Eisenhower wins and that's a that's an incredible January of 1957 and you can see here Michael um, at the podium with Eisenhower on, well, as we are looking at the photograph, Eisenhower obviously on the left and uh, Vice President uh, uh, Richard Nixon on the right. Um, Michael in the 1950s also established what was called the Decavolarion. When Athenagoras came in the 1930s, he realized the church didn't have any funds, so he 
mandated that uh, church members should be paying one dollar. By the early 1950s, Michael realized that, that the church needed many more funds because it was running so many programs. So he established the so-called Vecadolarion, which was a $10 subscription to the church at the time. The other thing he did is he formed the Goya, the Greek um, Orthodox Youth Association. Um, and the Goya was one of the few church uh, institutions in which English was allowed because, of course, young Greek Americans, uh, so some of them were not that familiar with the Greek. So Michael is the archbishop in the 1950s and um, this is the time when the church has really become mainstream. The Greek Americans have become mainstream and, and the Greek Orthodox Church, which was, it, it was marginalized. It, it wasn't marginalized in a negative way, but no one, no one really paid much attention to it. They didn't consider it very important. But by the 1950s, through the efforts of the church, and through the efforts of the Greek Americans and the progress of the, the Greek Americans, we have this incredible moment of uh, Michael giving the blessing at Eisenhower's um, inauguration. Archbishop Michael uh, will um, passes away um, is, is, uh, in 1959, and he is replaced by what is perhaps the most a uh, significant figure in uh, the history of the Greek Orthodox Church in the 20th century, Archbishop Iakovos. Archbishop Iakovos has served earlier on uh, as a priest in Boston, and he's also served on the uh, World uh, Council of Churches, so he's an experienced cleric, and he knows Greek America because he was in Boston for a time in the late 40s, early 50s. So he takes over in 1959, 1960, and in 1964, at the Clergy Laity uh, uh, Convention Congress, which takes place uh, in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, he talks about the need for the church to make the next step. We, we talked about Michael putting the church in the mainstream. Yakovos now says, we are now in the mainstream. We have got to stop behaving like an immigrant church. We are an American church. By, by that, he means that we should be uh, tending to the Greek American community, defending the faith, defending the language, defending Greek culture, but being open to America, being open to maybe non-Greek American persons uh, joining the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, having a, being more open, uh, being more welcoming, and uh, seeing seeing the church more as as much as an American one. As, as a Greek Orthodox one. And of course he puts this in practice and you know I think you know this is, I think you've seen the Life cover magazine, I'm not showing it to you for the first time but I'm, I included it this for the emphasis here that if the Greek church is an American church it's got to respond and engage with American issues. And, and when Martin Luther King invites clerics to go down to Selma in 1965 and march next to him. Many Greek Americans say, we don't want to get involved with the civil rights movement. It's, it's not, racism is not our fault. We were not, we were not here. We are recent immigrants. We had, it's got nothing to do with us. Uh, and, uh, and many Greek Americans are not sympathetic to the civil rights movement as well. But, but Yakovos believes that it's part of the Greek Orthodox ethos to stand on the side of those being oppressed and uh, uh, very, very bravely goes down to Selma where, you know, in the, the film we saw, there was this uh, 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 feature film a few years back, there was a, there was a military atmosphere in Selma. And in fact, Yakovos afterwards 
in an interview when they told him, what did you feel like when you were marching with Martin Luther King and there were all the, the National Guard and the police lined up on each side with their clubs and their guns? And Diakova said, you know, he said, I remembered when we were walking in Imvros, my hometown, my village, and uh, which was under Turkish rule, and I felt that we were the Greeks marching in front of the Turkish forces. So, you know, I think, I think this, this is a tremendously brave thing that Yakovos did, and he links it to the Greek Orthodox ethos, and he, he ties it to, to the fact that the Greeks were oppressed by the Ottomans, and therefore the Greeks can sympathize with people who are oppressed. And that was a very brave move, and not everyone approved, and there were many, many criticisms. But Yakovos st stood tall, and it's one of the most, the proudest moment for the in the history of Greek Orthodox in the 20th century, and inspires us uh, to this day. As part of opening up to America, as part of moving from becoming an immigrant church to becoming an American church, Yakovos says at a clergy laity congress that takes place in New York in 1970, he says that, you know, priests can decide if they have to do the liturgy in English, if their constituents are mostly second and third, Greek Amer uh, second and third generation Greek Americans who can't understand English, then the priest can decide to have parts of the liturgy in English. He had already spoken about the need of English at Denver in 64. Michael had allowed Goya to speak in English, but in 1970 we have two problems. And before I talk about the problems, let me explain. This is, a, this is from... Uh, this is uh, from New York. Uh, it's, it's where the opera house and the concert halls will be, uh, Lincoln Center. This is where Lincoln Center is, going, is being constructed in New York City. And the first thing they did is they had this opera, this uh, orchestra shell, and that's where the Yakovos went to do, um, to do an open-air liturgy in conjunction with the convention of 1970. So we have two problems. Yakovos' call for using English runs into two, two difficulties. First of all, from 1965-68 onwards, we have a new wave of immigration. Um, you know, I think, you know, most people who know the history of immigration in the United States, and we know the Greek experience, the United States closed its doors in 1922. In the 1920s, uh, it closed its doors to immigration from Southeast Europe, and, and Greek immigration basically was reduced to a trickle. It picked up after World War II with displaced persons and relatives and families, but it was really after 1965 when, uh, when immigration opened up again and we have a wave of Greeks. Most of those Greek, uh, Greeks who are obviously uh, Greek-born immigrants settle, many of them settle in Astoria. So New York has a very strong Greek-born population, many of whom are at the Greek media in New York, the Ethnikos Kyriks newspaper, the Atlantiva, the Atlantis closed in 1973, but it was it was running in 1970. The radio stations, etc., and those Greeks um, who were in New York, the the place where Yakovos declared the need to to do English, somehow misunderstood this, and there was a huge furor, and they went and complained to the Ecumenical Patriarch that that Yakovos is trying to Americanize the church too quickly, he's trying to make an independent church. It was a huge crisis that the, uh, the, the church went through. The language, the liturgical language crisis was a, was a huge big deal. Iakovos, of course, survives because Iakovos survives and does much better in most crises. 
but it really destabilized the church for two years. And it's just an illustration for us as we look back. It's a historical fact, but it's, it's more than that. It, it, it really explains to us how difficult it is, even as for a gifted leader like Iagoros, to strike the right balance. Greek America has to Americanize, but it's got to keep its Greek element. And how much you do that, how do you calibrate adapting to America without losing some of your Greekness is very difficult to do. And, and it's, it's, there's definitely no consensus. And Greek-born people will, be, will obviously be the ones resisting Americanization. Yakovos is calling for the liturgy to be in English, otherwise people won't understand what what's going on. Uh, so, you know, that's an obvious uh, reason to do that. But on the other hand, you're losing something of your tradition if you're doing too much English. And it's a debate, I think, that is really still going on in, in some ways. Yakovos, uh, aside from Americanizing the church, really puts the church in the mainstream. He, much more than his predecessors, Yakovos becomes, becomes uh, a frequent visitor to the White House. Here are uh, pictures of him with all presidents. Yakovos uh, got himself, Yakovos got into trouble. Yakovos becomes, becomes the interlocutor. He, he puts himself forward as the leader of the Greek Americans, the representative of the Greek Americans, who represents the Greek Americans to America and the White House. And he also positions himself as the person who can link Greek, uh, Greece to America as well through diplomatic channels by talking to Greek politicians as well as American politicians. That got, that got Iakovos in trouble during the seven-year dictatorship, the colonel's rule from 1967 to 1974 because Iakovos appeared to be very conciliatory towards the colonels. And what happened was um, in Greece he was accused of uh, representing the CIA during a, a time of uh, intense anti-American feeling in 1974 when uh, the US could not or did not stop Turkey from invading Cyprus. But to his credit, Iakovos, whom everyone was calling Siakovos in Greece at the time, manages to get involved with the uh, initiatives of the Greek American lobby from 1974 to 1978. Those of you, many of you might remember, the Greek American lobby persuaded Congress to uh, impose an embargo on arms sales to Turkey as a response for their invasion to Cyprus. And Iakovos was seen as, as the leader of the lobby and uh, that helped him grow in stature. So his role as interlocutor, as, as the bridge between Greece and the US, as the bridge between Greek America and the White House, uh, became enhanced by the 1980s. Right at that time, there were also voices within the church encouraging Yakovos to continue his Americanization at a bigger pace. I, I mentioned earlier the Greek born in Astoria wanted Americanization to proceed more slowly. American born Greeks members of the church were on the other, uh, other side of the, of the spectrum. Uh, one of them was Charles Moskos, the well-known sociologist who's written wonderful histories of Greek America. The other one was uh, 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 Steve Kunelis, James Steve Kunelis officially. Uh, who, who lived in the Bay Area, actually, and uh, he, he was, uh, both these men were gifted intellectuals, um, thoughtful analyses, and thoughtful analysts of Greek Orthodoxy and Greek America, and they were encouraging Iakovos to move uh, faster along the Americanization trajectory. 
And the 1980s were a time in which we have a um, true movement towards Americanization. There were very many uh, innovations that took place in 1982 at the Clergy Laity Congress that took place in San Francisco. Um, the, the, the report here, uh, the previous, th there was a Congress uh, in, in 1990 which, in which Moscos and Cunelis' ideas were involved, were incorporated into a proposal to, uh, made to the Archdiocese. Yakovos' 25th anniversary in 1984 was an important moment. A group of uh, reformers formed an organization in the 1980s, still in the 1980s. There's a lot happening in the 1980s. The, the Orthodox Christian laity, a, a Chicago-based group pushing for much more autonomy and Americanization is created. And um, but at the end of the 1980s, the Archdiocese has a problem because um, we've got the 1988 elections being contested between Republican candidate Bush and Democratic candidate Michael Dukakis. And wh what does the Archdiocese do? Um, if, it, if it supports Dukakis too clearly and too obviously, then it'll, it'll go back to behaving like an ethnic church. So Yakovos tries to balance balance between Bush and Dukakis. So he goes to both the Republican and the um, and the uh, Democratic conventions in the summer of '88 to show that Greek Orthodoxy, despite Dukakis's ethnicity, that Greek Orthodoxy in America is is an is 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 an American church. The 1990s. Um, which is the next phase and another chapter in the book is a moment in which things come to a head when Iakovos pushes for more Americanization and runs into trouble with the ecumenical patriarchate. This is the famous uh, event in Ligonier in 1994. Ligonier is a very small town in western Pennsylvania where the, one of the other Eastern Orthodox churches in America, the Antiochian Orthodox Church, has a resort area where Yaakovos decided to call a congress, a pan-Orthodox congress, in other words, have representatives of all the Eastern Orthodox churches, to discuss the possibility of an American Orthodox church an English-speaking, maybe, uh, by definition, it would be a, an English-speaking American Orthodox Church if it was going to incorporate everyone, all the Eastern Orthodox. And that was uh, an event that it was very controversial at the time. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomeos considered that Iakovos was going too fast. Yeah, he he, can, he was worried that the ecumenical patriarchate was losing, would lose its influence in America. Uh, so he censored Iakovos and eventually forced Iakovos to step down to resign in 1996. And that put an end to the type of fast track Americanization that Yakovos wanted, that Moscos and Cunelis were writing about as well. So Ligonier is a, is a, a, mo a check moment. I, I spoke again, it's so difficult to calibrate. How fast do you go? How slow do you go? Well, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomeos decided that Yakovos was going too fast and pulled him back. And Yakovos was late in his career anyway, so he steps down in 1996. And we are now, uh, as you can understand, I'm in my la few last slides of this presentation. Uh, so I will, and this is more recent history, and it's always difficult to talk about recent history because you've got less information. Uh, let me put it this way. We have a transition period in the history of Greek Orthodoxy. From 1996 to, 19, to 20, 
to 2019. From 1996 to 1999, we have Archbishop Spiridon, who you see on the left of the screen. Archbishop Spiridon was U.S. born, but had spent most of his uh, career in Europe and was the Archbishop in Italy. And he came to replace Iacovos, and it turned out that um, Archbishop Spiridon was too traditional. He, he was actually overreacting. Um, he, he, he tried to push back, pull back on the Americanization, and there was a tremendous controversy in the church, and things, things the church really didn't, didn't really um, recover. There was too much turmoil. So Spiridon was forced to step down. He was seen as autocratic, as a traditionalist. Uh, although you can understand where he was coming from, if if he he was sent to re to replace Iacovos, who had become too eager to Americanize, well, I think Spiridon assumed his role was to push back and traditionalize the church, but he, he fell off the other end. He did too much with tradition, and, the, and many le leading lay individuals in the church, um, and as many bishops, were resistant to Spiridon. And that leads us to Archbishop Dimitrios, who comes in in 1999, and um, is in his place, in his position for 20 years, uh, Dimitrios calms the waters. The criticisms about Archbishop Dimitrios are, of course, that he, he calms the waters down so much that uh, things are not moving forward. Uh, but, but he has to take credit for restoring peace and unity in the church after the tumultuous uh, tenure of uh, Archbishop Spiridon. Ultimately, in 2019, um, Archbishop Dimitrios is forced to step down, partially because he appears to have lost control of the church's finances, and the church's finances uh, are in a, a difficult state, precisely because huge sums are being collected for the construction of St. Nicholas Orthodox National Shrine to replace the old St. Nicholas Church, which was at the um, at the foot of the um, Twin Towers and was destroyed during the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001. And uh, the construction of the church was very troubled because sums of money were not properly accounted for, let me put it that way, and uh, Archbishop Dimitrios was forced to step down because of the controversies, the financial issues surrounding St. Nicholas can, uh, raised. However, and in, in, in closing this presentation, I, I think we should look at at St. Nicholas, the financial stuff from St. Nicholas was obviously, there were, there were obvious problems that have been, are being dealt with. And let's put those aside for a moment because there's, there's more meaning to St. Nicholas. I think the fact that the Greek Orthodox Church decides to, to rebuild this church with, in a very ambitious way with this, uh, you know, Calatrava, the um, Spanish architect who did a, a lot of Olympics 2004 stuff in Athens, have a modern type of church, and then call the church, not a church, but a national shrine open to worship for other religions as well. In some ways, it shows the confidence of the Greek Orthodox Church and the fact that it feels strong enough to invite other faiths to worship in what was a national shrine in a very, very obviously sacred place for the history of America. So in some ways, you know, um, I, I'm hoping that as the years go by, we will forget about the financial mess that was connected with St. Nicholas. And what we remember 
and as this church has get gets constructed, this is my own photograph on the left a few days a few years ago, but it's but now the rebuilding has started. What we will know when it's in place is something that shows us Greek Orthodoxy's confident appearance, uh, confident place in Greek America in the early 21st century. And this is my last slide, and th this is from a year ago. A, a year ago, in a few weeks, I was very lucky to be able to meet um, current Archbishop Elpidophoros at a talk he gave in New Jersey. I believe it was March 5th, a week, uh, eight days later, New Jersey and Pennsylvania closed down because of the pandemic. So we were very lucky to be able to, to, to be there. And uh, Archbishop Elpidophoros spoke about the, uh, the future of the church. And everyone asks me, okay, now you've talked about the trajectory of the church and its balance between uh, tradition and uh, Americanization. <laughs> What's going to happen in the future? Well, um, my, my mentor, Professor Spiros Vrionis, the Byzantine historian, always used to answer that question by saying, you're asking the wrong person about the, about the future. I'm a historian. I know about the past. I don't know about the future. And I will say the same thing. But it seems to me that what we have now is a gradual return to the visions of Yaakovos, but this time we have the ecumenical patriarch in control and on board. So the Greek Orthodox Church is moving again slowly towards the Americanization that was stopped in the early, in the 1990s, but it's a process in which, it, which is being moderated and modified and is in connection with the ecumenical patriarchate, which I think is very, very, it's a very good thing because at the moment the ecumenical patriarch is being threatened by the situation in Turkey. Greek Orthodoxy in America is a very valuable source of support for the ecumenical patriarchate. It's got to retain its ties to the ecumenical patriarchate, but on the other hand it's got to Americanize. And I think those two trends, Elpidophoros is, is the person who is in a position to manage both Americanization and attachment to the uh, ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. In that case, let us uh, all thank again our speaker, and we'll see you next month after Easter for our next speaker. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.